I'm Tammy Vendon, your host for Executive with a Cause. And today on the show, I welcome Pip Karen, the chair of Cleanup Australia, and their managing director, Terry Ann Johnson. And today we're going to chat about the good, the bad, and hard things about running a charity. Tip and Terry Ann, welcome to the show. Hi, Tammy. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Pip, we've known each other for a while. In fact, we met on my last podcast. Terry Ann, I, I know we haven't met before, but in case you're not aware, Clean Up Australia is one of my favorite charities. Well, I know that you've been actively involved because I've seen you in all the records. So <laughs> I know a lot about you. Uh, <laughs> great to put a face to the name, Tammy. Thank you. Well, it tells me you have a great CRM underneath all this, so we'll probably get into that at some point. For those people that are not familiar with Clean Up Australia, we do have an international audience. Could you, um, Pip, tell us more about the organization? Yeah, so Clean Up Australia was founded by my father, Ian Kiernan, 33 years ago. So uh, back in 1989, he started with Clean Up Sydney Harbour. And the inspiration for that first event was uh, he was a solo yachtsman and a builder. And he was sailing in a uh, round the world race and ended up in the Sargasso Sea. And that's meant to be one of the most pristine, beautiful parts of the world. But dad was quite horrified by the amount of pollution that he found there, um, predominantly plastic pollution. Uh, and being the practical man that he was, he decided to do something about it in his own backyard. And uh, that was clean up Sydney Harbour and 40,000 Sydney siders joined him for that first event. So he absolutely tapped into the sentiment at the time. And the following year, it became a national campaign with Clean Up Australia Day. And we've been going strong ever since. 30 something years. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 33 years. So, so let's talk about the basic concept of what exactly is a cleanup. I think people have visions in their head, but it obviously could be as large as the first one. But there's also smaller ones, too. Oh, absolutely. And our work extends beyond, you know, we're best known for our week of action with Clean Up Australia Day being the first Sunday in March every year. Uh, but, but our work extends all through the year. You know, we know that our waste challenges go far beyond just one day. So we, we support the community and schools and businesses to clean up any day of the year that they choose. So we have around a million volunteers each year. Wow. And more than half of those join us in that week of action and the rest of them all through the year. So we have some groups who might adopt a particular location that they they clean up regularly. Others just um, pick a problem hotspot for that year that they want to tackle. So we support all sorts of um, members of the community doing doing their bit to help look after the environment. So with that many events and a million volunteers a year, yeah. Terry Ann, how many employees do you actually have? <laughs> we have five of us. Five. So there are five, five in our team. So we're a lean, mean machine that um, definitely delivers above our weight. Now, for an organization that relies on on volunteers, that's not unusual for a charity. But the majority of your volunteers you never see. What unique challenges do you have with that? The key element for us is their safety. So what we have in place is, you're right, because we don't see them and because they tell us where they're cleaning up, it's vitally important that we know that they are safe at all times. So we've spent a lot of time uh, researching and working with councils. We have some fantastic relationships with councils right across Australia. And what we do is when people tell us where they're going to clean up, we actually get that signed off by the council to make sure it's safe and also that conditions haven't changed between the time when somebody has decided, yep, that needs some attention to I'm actually going to go and do it. So it's a really case of us then gearing them up to make sure they've got the right equipment so that they remain safe, they've got the knowledge on what they need to do to stay safe, and that they're also in contact with us. So we're available 24 seven, and um, we can help them at any point in time to make sure that their cleanup is as productive and as much fun as it can possibly be as well. And what are some of the resources you provide to these volunteers? 
So we provide them with gloves. Now the gloves that we provide are like a, a lightweight gardening glove. They're a cotton lined plasticized glove. So they're, they're a bit sticky, which means they can pick up things. You're not going to have stuff slip and break in your hands. And then they receive some bags into which they then put their rubbish for a collection by the local council. And uh, so they get recycling bags and they get non-recycling bags. And those bags are either made out of a nice heavy hessian so that they're quite um, impervious to being torn, or they're made out of uh, their bio bag. And the bio bags that we specially commission are very thick. They're like about the thickness of a David Jones Meyer bag, but they're made out of cornstarch and, and potato starch. And so again, they withstand ripping and tearing. And so they bag up all of their um, all of the rubbish that they remove and they put it out for collection. So along the way, we provide them with guidance. So we have what we call a site guide, which is the Bible on how to run your location and, and also lots of tips and hints on how to stay well, how to stay healthy, first aid tips and hints, uh, making sure that the site supervisor, who is a volunteer, is as geared up and as prepared as they can possibly be. Yeah. With this many volunteers, though, it's still challenging. Pip, you, you talked about the first one that your father did. I'm curious, how did you fund the first one? Because all these resources you're you're talking about, they do cost money. It's not like you can just create all these bags and gloves and things from scratch. You actually are providing with a resource, even though all the workforce is a volunteer. How did you pay for that first one, and how do you continue to generate revenue to support that? Yeah, it's a good question. And our, our funding comes from um, a number of ways. So we have donations from um, the general public and every cent that we're um, given from the general public goes straight back into providing those free kit materials to schools and community and the education materials to schools. Um, we also have partners uh, who sponsor sponsor us and help you know, pay for the materials um, that we provide. And then we have in-kind um, sponsorship as well. So they might help provide the materials we use or provide services to our organisation. Um, so really with the first one, it, you know, it started with sponsorship back then. And um, you know, I, I'm sure that my father was ringing around mates and, and contacts asking for help. But you know, the, the way we do it has evolved as well, because that early one um, was very much bring, you, bring your own gear to the, the Sydney Harbour event. And, and over time, it's evolved in that we're providing those resources to, to those groups to help them with their efforts. I imagine over time, other things have changed too. I, I noticed, Terry Ann, you've been with the organization for quite a long time as well. Operationally, in addition to providing them with more resources for the actual events, what else has changed? The whole process of how we actually collect information from them has changed a lot as well. So in the early days, you had to actually send in a physical handwritten registration form to tell us where you were cleaning up. And we had mountains and mountains of paper all the way around the office. And we had huge big maps up on the walls where we would put little red dots on where all the locations were. And that was the only way we had a sense of the scope and scale of what we were doing. Now it's all electronic. So everything is digitized. So they now register online. We send them materials. If they don't want hard copy paperwork, it's all electronically dispersed to them. We collect data from people through online processes. So you can now tell us all about your cleanup, um, you know, the number of volunteers you had, um, what they found and what exciting things happened. You, know, you can post photos, you can. So it's a lot more immediate um, both the dispatch and the receipt of information. So our engagement with a volunteer is now a lot clearer and cleaner, if you like, than it used to be where there would be days of um, you know, between the time that you put up your hand to say, I'm interested to the time you actually received your materials. Now you can tell us this morning that you want to register and your kit will be dispatched to you that same day. Yeah. Well, I imagine though there's been a lot of change in the last couple of years and it's not just been covid it's actually been the bushfires and the flooding and such as well and pip i heard you talking about just before the last cleanup australia day i know that there was a, a lot of impact up north by the floods how has that changed the way that you've had to do things to work around all these issues it, it certainly is probably not a a new thing but it just seems like there's more of it 
Mm, yeah, well, well, it wasn't just up north in Queensland. It was New South Wales as well, as you know, with the flooding. And um, it was quite heartbreaking to, to go through that and see what those communities were suffering. Um, and there were around 600 sites that we had to postpone um, just before Clean Up Australia Day because, you know, it, they couldn't go ahead. They were dealing with their own, um, you know, flooded homes and communities. So. Uh, but the beauty of what we do is we can we can support um, communities all through the year, and we know that from the floods in the Hawkesbury last year, that there is a time, usually around six to eight weeks after the flood event, that they can see where the litter's collected, and they want that you know they want that concerted help from the community to come together and help clean up those hot spots so we supported the Hawkesbury to do that um, at that time and we'll do the same with with the flood impacted communities um, this year yeah brilliant uh, Terry and I want to go back to the whole idea of data and how that's changed over time I know I used to fill in forms when we spawn or um, hosted a cleanup day and you'd ask us all these questions about, you know, what are we finding? And that's obviously really valuable, not just to you, but the local government as well. Um, how are you collecting all that information and using it? So we collect it through various means now. We encourage people to send it in electronically because that's the quickest way to be able to um, just undertake your accounts while you're immersed in the project or in your event and then get it into us. And then that way also we can immediately start processing that data into the forms that we then share it with the CSIRO. We share it with state governments. We've used it um, extensively in our advocacy for resource recovery and waste management reform. So the, you know, the banning of single use plastic items, we go through all of that really valuable data that is provided to us and we we collate it all into all of those forms that we now need to be able to go to those people those decision makers and also to businesses and influence their their thinking about how they participate in the supply chain and also how they're uh, really actively trying to limit the environmental footprint associated with their goods or their services or their products so it's really it's vital information and and the other key thing for us is that we are very conscious that this data that has been collected for over 30 years belongs to the community. Mm. And so we provide it free of charge to anybody who wants it. We take out all the personal stuff and we then make sure that we really focus on getting as wide a use of this knowledge that, uh, you know, that we're very privileged to be the custodians of on behalf of that community. Mm. That has, you know, it's a big effort to count your rubbish as you've experienced. And I have. Not <laughs> it's not exactly pleasant. No. <laughs> it's not a pleasant job. It's a messy task at the end of the day. But it's really vitally important because mm. what we're finding is the trends over the years. So we can see and we can we can see, tell and share the direct impacts of the implementation of a con of a container refund yeah. scheme. We can see that what that happens. We know that there's a big spike and then we know it levels off and then it all starts you're going back down again and we lose those plastics and we lose those metals and we lose those really valuable components. They're no longer in the environment. They're actually back in the resource recovery stream, the recycling stream. And that's what's really vitally important to us. And because that data is provided by the community, they are now actively engaged in the way that journey is progressing. And that's something they can be very proud of. Yeah, well, where are you storing that data? It's stored in um, in a very, very extensive Excel set of spreadsheets. Oh, <laughs> oh I might be on. <laughs> we, publish, <laughs> we publish it every year. So we, we produce the rubbish report um, in the lead up to Clean Up Australia Day every year. So it's, it's shared widely. Um, we, as Terry Ann said, because it, you know, it's collected by those very hardworking volunteers, and we we want to make that public. So we share it with media. We publish it on our website. And the other interesting thing that um, Terry Ann touched on briefly when she was talking about container deposit schemes is that we we have evolved that over time in terms of the categories that we are 
reporting on to reflect what our volunteers are collecting. So now we're seeing, um, particularly through the pandemic, we've seen we've started collecting information around pandemic waste. So around masks and um, you know more single use items, and we're seeing a trend towards things like e-cigarettes and oh. nangs and okay. items like that. So as our behaviour changes, um, so does what ends up as litter. Um, it, re it reflects our changing habits. I want to ask you about that, Pip, the Citizen Science Project. Could you tell us more about that particular project? Because I think it's very relevant to what you just said. Yeah, so that was uh, something that we launched for Clean Up Australia Day this year because, you know, we knew anecdotally that our volunteers are, are picking up so much more of these pandemic related items. So it's not just the single use masks, it's the things like the sanitised wipes, it's the coffee cups because cafes said no to the reusable coffee cup. Um, it's the takeaway food packaging because we couldn't eat in restaurants. So we wanted to um, as well as encouraging those that are willing to do the full rubbish report, we wanted to provide a quicker snapshot um, to get a sense of just how many of these single use face masks and other common pandemic related items are ending up as waste in the environment, um, as litter in the environment. And, so what are, we'll, and what are you finding? So we're, we're still collecting that and we'll we'll look to releasing that information towards the end of the year. But but it, it's as we suspected that, you know, we are seeing um, a lot more of those those items ending up as litter. Uh, and we see I mean, you've only got to walk down the street. Um, you know, I know WA is seeing it right now because they're still having um, mandatory uh, mask wearing in um, in most public places. So once that happens, you see. Um, a surge in them ending up um, discarded on footpaths and in, you know, parks and things. And, you know, the crucial thing we need to remember there is anything that you drop on the ground eventually ends up in a waterway. So, yeah. you know, we really wanted, to, we wanted our call to action for Clean Up Australia to be, day to be strongly around, let's pick these items up and get them out of the environment before they end up in our waterways. A couple of years ago, I, I hosted a cleanup of Lake Burley Griffin here in Canberra, and it was during the drought. And what was really interesting about that was it unveiled a lot of things that were lost in the lake a decade or two before mm -hmm. that you would not have found any other way. I suspect that your citizen project is going to identify issues now, but is it is it you know, true that my my feel is that you're going to continue to find these things in the environment for the next decade. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I and because it's... the sad part is they're not going to break down or break up even. So, well, I mean, the worst case scenario is they break up into smaller pieces so they enter the food chain even earlier, but they're certainly not going to break down. And it's really interesting, even around um, you're around where we are in Sydney, we're finding that masks are still required in, in places like supermarkets and things like that. So where you're finding a lot of them and where our uh, volunteers are coming back and telling us it's the car park. So people get out of the area where they've needed to wear their masks and they can't wait to get it off. And so they get it off and it, they either inadvertently or um, surreptitiously uh, discard it in some way, shape or form, or it drops out of a vehicle or, and yeah, these things are just lying there and they get sodden and then they, they start to you know, tear into smaller and smaller pieces and the fibres get into, yeah, they're really insidious and they're lasting a long, yeah. long time. So given that this has been mandatory for a while in, in many places, not just here, but around the world as well, and just a precaution for many right now, what are the options for recycling medical goods like masks? Yeah. You, you've hit on the on the hot topic and one that we did talk about in the lead up to Clean Up Australia Day is that this is an opportunity, you know, two years ago, who'd have thought that a, an everyday household item would be a single use um, face mask? It's an opportunity to look back at the design of these products and design them so they can be absolutely as safe as, as they can be for us but also thinking about the environmental footprint that they leave behind. Uh, and, you know, this idea that when we design a product, we think about its end of life. We have this sense of product stewardship. So, you know, it's not just designing it and whatever, when it's, you know, wherever it ends up, I don't 
that's not my concern. We need to think at the design stage, what happens? How do we capture those materials? How can we design them so they have less impact on the environment? So it, it's an opportunity. So question for you, Pip, because the organization for the last 30 years has really looked at reduction, but but also really just picking up rubbish after people have already disposed of it in an untidy way. Mm. It, it feels like you're evolving. And just looking at your website, I noticed that you had you had links to suppliers that are using recycled products or recycled plastic products. And, and um, that seems to be something that's fairly new. Can you talk more about that direction in terms of how the organization may be changing operationally and also from a vision perspective? Mm. Yeah, so where you know our, our heritage has been, as you've said, about removing litter from the environment, and that's still a really important part of what we do. And and we are a grassroots, um, community-led organisation. But our evolution, you know, the, our work that we do today is as much about preventing litter in the first place as it is about removing it. And that's you know the, the important advocacy work we do. So we work with government, we work with like-minded businesses to, to bring about that change and move away from this linear approach that I've just talked about with um, PPE equipment where we're designing for a circular approach where we're thinking about how do we um, get these resources again at, at their end of life and and you were at the plastic summit a few years ago yeah. you know the pledges that were made and some of the great progress that we've seen over the last couple of years in this country towards doing just that and and investing in this um idea of a circular economy where we and this is what my father was talking about you know 33 years ago <laughs> wasn't he da the need to um to think of waste as a resource mm -hmm. we can't think of some of waste as something we toss in the ground and it's a problem for future generations we think we need to think of everything as a resource and how can we design it so that we can get maximum life out of it and then capture it and reuse it again. So, you know, that's a really important part of our work, but everything we do is about practical action and empowering the community and giving the community a sense of hope that, you know, it's the small steps we take together that that lead to great change. And, and we're, we're helping, we're trying to guide all of our stakeholders um, on that journey. So, yeah, I think we'll probably always be about picking it up out of the environment as well as um, affecting, you know, real change to, to stop it at its source. Yeah. And I imagine, uh, terri for you as the managing director, as that vision changes a little bit, are, are not, not the overall goals, but, but just how you support those goals changes. With five people, that's not a significant number of people to support additional programs. So how do you see the operational side changing to meet this vision that Pip just spoke about? For us, the, the key element here is in the partnerships that we develop and the, you know, the people that we bring on as part of those partnerships. Because every single organization that partners with CleanUp um, shares our vision on what we want to achieve and they're also very much on the sustainability journey. And let's be honest, they've got a lot more resources than we have. Yeah. So what we do is we very actively encourage them to share not just their, their funds and their networks, but also their skills, because they have a massive bank of skills within their organisations. So every single one of them provides us with either knowledge or opportunity or people to actually make things happen. And you're a really great example, Tammy, you were talking about how is our data collection evolving. We're working with an organization called Slalom at the moment, and they have absolutely revolutionized how we collect, analyze, and then display our data. And that's that, that's a skill set that we just did not have. Uh -huh. And so there it's it's really vitally important whenever you're in you're in a not-for-profit situation and you've got limited um, ability to bring the skills in-house that you maximize the opportunities that all of your great partnerships are going to bring to leverage those skills and they love it yeah. I have to say it's really really rewarding from a corporate perspective when you think of the growth of volunteering days if you put your volunteering efforts into something which 
gives you a very tangible result and an outcome, whether it's a physical or whether it's a brand new way that an organization can run something. It's very rewarding. You can actually put your little tag on that and say, and this is exactly what the team at Slum are doing. Yeah, they get such a buzz out of the fact that they have, as I said, revolutionized the way we are collecting, dealing with and displaying our data. Oh, it's, it's brilliant that you have partners like that, because that was going to be one of my suggestions if you didn't have one in place. The the <laughs> evolution of data is obviously changing policy, too. And I know that in our cleanup, one of the things I tried to find was right after the plastic ban, the plastic bag ban locally here in the ACT, was trying to count the number of plastic bags that we found. And over time, it got to the point where we might find one or two, period, mm -hmm. which was Prove really? to the local government that they made a hard decision, but they made a really good one for the environment. I imagine that you're using data very much the same way to influence policy. We've, we could see that there's a lot of changes before the pandemic already with recycling and um, the ability to offload plastics we didn't want. Are you seeing anything change right now other than the, the medical waste that has been growing in related to that, are you seeing any additional trends that are maybe positive? Yeah, there's a lot of really good stuff happening. So it starts, if we start with the government level, it's starting at the federal government level. So we have targets now. We have a waste management plan, a federal national waste management plan in place, and it has targets associated with that. And that then feeds down to the states. And we're actually seeing a lot of implementation for the replacement with alternatives for a lot of single-use products. Predominantly plastic, the focus definitely has been on single-use plastics, but other single-use items are being replaced with um, really great alternatives as well. So you've got um, the retailers that have taken all of their lines of single-use picnic um, off the shelf and replaced it with reusable items. You're seeing you know, things like barrier bags being taken out of the supermarket chain now. So you don't have a barrier bag to put your vegetables in that is a single-use plastic bag anymore. It's now an alternative that is more easily disposed of or more readily sustainably disposed of or reusable. Mm. We're seeing you you only have to go shopping to see the number of people that are taking their own bags in. Yep. Um, so it's a behavioural change as well. So it feeds right down then to the consumer. So each of us can make a more informed choice about the alternative that we want to adopt that best suits our lifestyle. You don't have to wear a hair shirt to be an environmentalist. It can actually be a really classy, um, sexy thing to do. Yeah, there are yeah. really, really, very, there are some really sexy water bottles out there at the moment. And there's some great reusable coffee cups. And you, you stamp your personality on them. They become okay. part of your range of accessories that, you know, that sets you up on who you are. And so you're making an, an informed choice to be part of the solution. Mm. So it starts at that federal government level. It goes all the way through the states, through local governments, through the retailers, the supply chain, and the consumer is a vital component yeah. as well. Would you mind if I had to state an observation? I, talking to both of you, since this podcast is about also understanding the operations behind the scenes, you both have been there for so long and um, from your legacy and, and Carrie Ann as the managing director. I'm very curious to know how you split your roles. I think that's really interesting because every organization has a different role for its chair and, and the managing director or CEO. How do you split your roles between the two of you? Yeah, it's a good point. And I think that, you know, the relationship between the chair and the managing director or CEO is such an important relationship. And Terry ann and I have been really fortunate to share a good relationship and work very well together. Um, and neither of us are precious. So we, you know, we have good open conversations regularly. But really, my role is obviously, you know, the, the chair and all the, the governance associated with um, with that role and um, leading the board and 
um, you know, selected and brought together a, a relatively new board after Dad died. Um, but I also uh, take on a um, spokesperson and um, ambassadorial role for the organisation as well. So I, I um, act as our media spokesperson and um, get involved in, and you know, speaking events and, and um, various events where we're representing the Clean Up Australia brand. But so does Terry Ann. So we, you know, we always talk about, you know, what, where, where do we split it? How do we, um, how do we spend our time, and, and what's the best use of our time? Uh, and then I'll let Terry Ann talk about her important role. <laughs> uh, so my role is very much here, uh, making sure all of the operations run as smoothly as possible. So you know, as the CEO, you've got to make sure that the, the organisation is financially viable. Um, so you've got to make sure that your income streams are actually man you're meeting or exceeding your outgoings um, to make sure that you are um, that you stay fluid. Um, that your cash flow is working for you, that all of your team is um, is participating to the best of their ability. Uh, they're also growing as individuals as part of being part of the organisation and that our partnerships are working as well for our partners as they are for us. Because you know, for us, it is about partnership. It's about joining together because you've got a shared vision and also making that happen. So it's not just about delivering a whole heap of benefits for someone who gives you a check. It's more about what are we going to achieve together over this period of time that we're going to have the privilege of working together. Yeah, so you manage so really those relationships? About, sorry? So you manage those relationships, those partners? So those relationships are managed by, yeah, by either me directly or by the team. Uh -huh. It depends on where the relationship actually came in. Yeah. So a lot of the time, if the, if the relationship comes in through one of the team, then it's vitally important that team rem member remains involved. And similarly, a board member. If the relationship has come through a board member, it's vitally important that that board member remains involved in that relationship as well, because that's how it came together. And, you know, and our, our board is very much an extension of our team. You know, Pip, I think Pip underrates the, the wonderful job that she did in recruiting um, the revitalised board when she took over as chair. Yeah, you know, she's brought on people who are very networked, they're young, they're keen, they're entrepreneurial, but they're also prepared to get down and get their hands dirty. You know, they'll come in and they'll help us pack materials or they'll go out to clean up sites and they'll go and get all muddy and dirty and really bunker in with everybody else. Mm. They're, they're actively engaged in the organisation and very committed. And, yeah. and that's every single person that, um, you know, that I've been privileged to work with through the years I've been here or associated with through boards and also partners have been prepared to get down and get in there. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the vital thing. And I think, Tammy, the other, the other vital thing is particularly for a charity, probably more so than a corporation, mm -hmm. is this idea of ethics. And ethics, you have to set the ethical tone at the top. So from the board to the CEO um, to every member of the team, it, it must be, you know, you have to live and breathe those ethics and you have to demonstrate um, how you want the organisation to be run because we are the custodians of, you know, donations from the public, we're trusted, and that's a, that's a really big responsibility and one that we take very seriously and we have got a highly ethical board and team and, and I think that culture is just so important. It, it needs to flow through everything you do. Mm -hmm. Well, I think especially with such a small team, it sounds like the board and the staff that are being paid are quite tight. And obviously, mm -hmm. those values are going to be absolutely critical to make that work because you, you are such a large national brand despite the size of the organization that people would have no idea that you're as small as you are. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand, Terry Ann, you're going to be leaving soon after, what, almost 20 years at the organization. There, there's got to be both angst and um, excitement for you and I suppose for Pip too to think about the future and how things might change because you've been so integral and part of the organization for so long. Can we talk about succession planning a little bit? Because anyone that's been there that long, you have to start to think at some point they might want to leave. How did you um, go about making this decision? Um, I suppose probably together just because you're so tight 
And then what are your plans for making sure that that succession change is successful? Smooth, yeah. (laughs) Well, I think, you know, I guess the overwhelming emotion for me is gratitude um, to Terry ann gratitude for the professionalism she's brought to the role and the the heart and soul that she's put into the organisation, you know, working with my father and, and now with me, I feel very privileged that I've had the opportunity to work with her and to have that passing of knowledge and, um, you know, those grains, those pearls of wisdom <laughs> that she shared. So, you know, it's a lovely, it's a lovely transition. I think, you know, it was, it's so fortunate that, um, you know, we have such a great relationship and that Terry ann could do it when she's ready. Um, and she feels the time's right. She feels that the organisation's in just such a healthy um, state that it, it is it is a good time to have a changing of the guard. And I think you need to be open in those conversations, which we always have been, and so is the board. And and one of the most important um, functions of a of a good board is to um, ensure that you are thinking and talking about uh, CEO succession as we as we always have. So we're going through that process now of um, recruiting those big shoes to fill. Uh, but we've got, you know, it'll be it'll be a nice orderly transition. Terry Ann has said that uh, she will stay with the organisation uh, until we find the right replacement and make sure it's it's a good handover. Uh, but, you know, she's done a great job of making sure that it's a team that we've shared, you know, there is shared knowledge. Um, we've got great plans for the future and, you know, a nice cohesive board. Um, good, you know, good. We're clear on what the organisation stands for and, and our, um, you know, our ethos and principles. So we're in great shape and... Um, Yes, it's a, it's a heavy heart that we say good, goodbye to her, but I, we're not saying goodbye. We'll be keeping we'll be keeping her close. So. I'm sure she'll be recruited for every cleanup day that you have. <laughs> Getting her hands dirty. I mean, as, yeah, as part of that handover too, yeah, we've been really consciously for quite some time now. So as the the team um, was recruited and settled in, um, each one of them has been asked to document. Um, all of the procedures that when they came in just weren't quite so obvious to them. And so what we've built up over time is a a bank of experience, which is documented experience. And so we go back and we revisit that on a regular basis just to make sure that if one of us isn't around at any point in time, somebody else can walk in and be able to undertake that person's role for a period. And I think that's really important. And it's it's one of the, um, it's a bit like the McDonald's philosophy. Yeah, there's the most senior people of McDonald's also go back behind the counter yeah. on a regular basis. And so that's what you, we've always tried to do. There's no hierarchy at cleanup. It's a very egalitarian organisation and we all pitch in and help one another out. So it's vitally important for us or really important for us that we all understand um, how things operate and what needs to be done to ensure that our volunteers whenever they ring in or call us or need us for anything, get the consistent um, best advice and best practical assistance that we can give them from whoever they've talked to yeah. at any point in time. So we've, we've actively done that and we'll continue to do that. And yes, every now and then something will happen now that you know, if we're all in tune on the fact that I will be going and someone will say, oh, God, TA, where do you get that? This is where you get that. So you just write this down and make sure that... Um, so there'll be lots and lots of yeah, time frames and timetables and things left for the new CEO. And yeah, as Pip said, I'm, I'm quite happy to spend time with my successor to help them settle in yeah. and then be available if they need it. Look, they may turn around and say, you know what? Off you go. This is my <laughs> show now. You, you can go. And that's fine too. That's fine too. Yeah, well, I think... I will absolutely respect um, how the new CEO wants to do that. Yeah. Well, at the same time, I think some good advice about just being cognizant of documenting your procedures, no matter how big you are. Um, I, I think some people think it's a luxury when you have a bigger staff, but the reality is you need it even more when you're smaller. I have um, just one final question because I'm conscious we're out of time. Just 
there's a lot of things that you guys are doing now. It looks like you have a lot of new programs that are happening. If people want to get involved in a Clean Up Australia Day, any day of the year, what should they do? Well, it's so easy because it's all on our website. So you can go to cleanup.org.au and you can register um, your event or you can see on our website the various ways you can get involved. I mean, we have things like a plogathon where you can walk and pick up rubbish at the same time. You can do that with a small group or on your own. We have people who get sponsored in their plogathon and then donate the funds to Clean Up Australia. Um, you can make a pledge of, you know, a simple change you're making in your daily habits um, and share that on our social media channels. Uh, you can make a donation to help us um, continue the work we do. There's, there's so many ways to get involved and it's it's easy to, to find it there on our website. And there's also lots of resources to help you make those everyday changes that we've touched on that, um, you know, that each of us can be part of that journey towards uh, being more sustainable. So that's cleanupaustralia.org? Cleanup.org. Cleanup.org. Au. Okay. Cleanup.org.au. And I think, Tammy, where it starts is next time you're out and about or any of your listeners or, or anyone watching this is out and about, just stop and have a look around you. And you know, next time you're racing through the park to get the bus or the tram or the ferry or whatever, just actually stop and have a look and see if there's rubbish accumulating. Because if there is... That means that you can be part of the solution by letting us know about that and by getting some friends out there to help you, which is a really simple and rewarding act of picking up that rubbish. And then once you start seeing it, you won't stop seeing it. It's really, you know, and it's lurking underneath all the bushes and it's all out there waiting for us to intervene, to stop it getting into our waterways, wherever yeah. they are, and, and to stop it harming our wildlife. It's a, it's a good point and it's prompted me to think that, you know, there's also many ways that we have for businesses to get involved. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's lots of great team building activities that businesses love to participate in with Clean Up Australia. So whether that's, you know, um, training that we can provide, some online training for teams or running a, a team event to clean up, or there's, there's lots of different ways that... Um, organizations are, are getting behind the cause great you're never too old you're never too young and you're never too busy <laughs> <laughs> thank you I, I tell you Pippin and Carrie Ann I, I probably have done I don't know at least five or six cleanups in the Good last job. in the last couple of years alone and I would agree with you that there's once you see it you can't remove it from your site you see it everywhere and the things that you both do and your organization does does actually make a huge difference to not just the one day that somebody cleans up things, but also from an educational perspective of getting people to change their ways and to get businesses behind that and policy makers too. Thank you for the work that you do. And we really hope that, um, that we get to see even more exciting things in the future. Good luck to you, Terry, and as you move into the next chapter of your life and, and Pip, as you start thinking about the future of the organization with a new CEO. I'm really excited to see what you guys do next. Oh, thanks for having us, Tammy. So lovely to chat with you. Hi, this is Tammy again. When I'm not doing podcasts, I'm helping not-for-profits with their IT decisions. In this week's segment, IT in Plain English, I have another question. And this week's question is, how can I avoid blowing my budget on an IT project? This is a really good question and something that happens a lot. Now, I've been on all sides of an IT project. I have been the procurement officer, I've been the customer, I've been the vendor, and I've been the implementation project manager. And I could tell you, I have a lot of scars and wounds because of these projects. But the number one piece of advice I can give you for any IT project is to avoid customizing the system. Now, I know there's a lot of reasons why you might wanna do something different or special, but the reality is that this is where the majority of your extra costs will come from. The better thing to do is to try to find a solution that already meets your needs. So that might be from a functionality perspective or even the workflows that you have, because remember that the vendors will be creating their workflows and functionality based on the majority of their own clients that they have already. And that's usually best practice. So if you can, 
change your processes to meet the system's needs rather than trying to change the system to meet yours. I guarantee you, you will save a lot more money by doing it this way. So hopefully that will get you started with a um, question in IT. If you have a question for me, just feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to take any uh, direct messages where I might actually answer your question on the air. So uh, for those of you who are executives of the cause, I just wanted to say thank you to you and your teams for the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. You are making a difference in this world, and we really thank you for your work.